We're all inherently lazy, striving about in one direction, then getting distracted and moving off into another, aimless, unfocused, unconcentrated, wanting the easy path to trod, while indulging in the self-congratulations and pats on the backs from our friends and families when we think we deserve it. In a sense, we are no different from the 14th century Italian poet Petrarch when he related his ascent of Mount Ventoux and compared it to the spiritual ascent and how he admitted he took an indirect and longer path because it was easier. How many times do we opt for the easier path and what does it cost us? We can talk about theurgy all day long. We can schematically outline Iamblichus's chain of being his complex theological and philosophical understandings, but all this is simply knowledge for the sake of knowledge. It does not lead us much closer to real theurgy, especially if we want to adhere to Iamblichus's curriculum. Iamblichus speaks of six levels of virtue, organized in a hierarchical fashion, like a ladder. All of these virtues are contained within all other virtues, so it is not necessarily a strict ladder where you can ignore the other rung as you climb over it. One virtue is no better than the other, even though they are presented hierarchically, although it does indicate that a level of development has been achieved. To have achieved one virtue is no guarantee that the other will also be attained. The virtues are natural virtues, ethical virtues, political or civic virtues, purificatory virtues, theoretical virtues, and finally, theurgic virtues. There is no skipping steps, there is no easy path, no magic pill or mushroom, no eureka moment. And although Iamblichus and other Neoplatonists elucidate some of the earlier virtues, there remains absolutely zero writings of theurgic virtues. It may be that we've lost this knowledge, or perhaps, more realistically, that once a soul has achieved that state, it cannot be articulated or put into writing anyway. Many people online claim to be theurgists, but it's doubtful the work has been truly done to warrant such a claim. We need to arrive at the precondition necessary before we can take the first step on this journey. Many of you will argue that you already know these things, that I'm being pedantic or difficult, that you very well understand the esoteric and occult nature of these things. Perhaps you've experienced mystical states, perhaps you've performed incantations, understood the power of words and silence. But what if I were to tell you that the dangers reside in not properly purifying the mind and the soul and the body? Iamblichus suggests that there is a fine line between theurgical practice informed by the virtues, philosophical and theological contemplation and preparation, and the basis of sorceries. How do we prepare our receptacles for containment of the divine and the gods? Because otherwise we surely would go mad. But I'm already getting ahead of myself. Simply put, the state that you must begin with before the path of learning is to commence is that of aporia. How long you stay in a state of aporia is entirely determined by you. And by you, I mean by your soul. This isn't necessarily a conscious act. You can be there for weeks, months, years, decades. Aporia does not simply end when we wish it to. If we look up aporia, we find it translated as difficulty of passing, difficulty of questions, a want of means or resource, embarrassment, hesitation. So what is the real meaning behind these very definitions? Due to the later reinterpretations by Aristotle and other philosophers up to the present day, aporia was identified as a logical categorization to designate the presentation of difficult and complex puzzles to solve in a philosophical manner. It became a list of presented problems that the philosopher sought to prove or disprove based on his intellectual prowess. But aporia is more forceful and demanding than all that. In its original sense, aporia characterizes a state of pathlessness, disorientation, confusion, alienation. You do not know what is up or down, what is left or right. Are your feet on the ground? Where is the ground? As you float limbless and headless in between places that are not places. Do you possess wisdom? What is wisdom? How about knowledge? What is that? If this sounds familiar, it is precisely the state that Socrates intended to evoke in all of his conversations with his interlocutors. It is fundamentally the realization that everything you believe or think you know is an empty, hollow shell. 
There remains no more self-importance of that oh-so-deceptive ego, the belief that we are very great enlightened beings. The fact that there is security in this world and that we partake of the benefits of that security. That rational discourse and reason can speak to the ultimate questions. These tools burn away our false sense of identity and beliefs, but the dignity of the soul is awakened through other means. Aporia is a state in which we do not know how we have come to be, who we are, what we are, and why we are. In Plato's Symposium, he writes of the marriage between Peña, the goddess of need and poverty, and Poros, her opposite, the god of plenty, also the opposite of Aporia. On Aphrodite's birthday, the two of them were married, and Peña conceived the child Eros. Eros, as we've mentioned before in previous videos, is the vehicle by which we ascend to the gods. It is a yearning that propels us, but aporia, as we discussed, is the need, that humiliating need that compelled Peña to forcefully impregnate herself with the drunk Poros' seed. Humiliation, abnegation, dejection, vulnerability, these are all elements of aporia, and within this resides the power of humility, the humility that is an absolutely necessary precondition before we can proceed on that first step towards the ultimate goal of henosis. Do not be fooled or mistaken. It is the simplest step, but the one in our age of narcissism and cheap substitutions for knowing and being, it is the step we are least likely to want to take. It bruises our egos, our self-identity. It rearranges our entire cognitive and spiritual makeup. After the state of aporia, Eros guides us in the direction of our thought and thinking. Since ultimately, reading Hesiod's Theogony, you realize that Eros is one of the earliest cosmogonic forces that even predate the gods. Aporia is a shock to the system. This shock awakens Eros and that Eros must be nurtured and united with the demiurgic powers. The state of alienation is not a modern phenomenon in an increasingly artificial world cut off from the gods. As Iamblichus believed, it is the perennial condition of the human soul. Each soul acts as a mean, an intermediary function between extreme polarities that are irreconcilable. It is our essence to be that way. To say anything definitive and unipolar of the soul is to speak falsely of it, and to strip it of its nature. The soul's fundamental ousia, or essence, had changed when it entered embodiment into this world. The gods and higher beings remain stable, but it is the lot of the human soul to be equally divided, equally permanent and stable like the immortals, but also changeable and impermanent like all other mortal beings. Without the soul first accepting its aporia, the erotic movement that innate gnosis of the gods can never begin, and we find ourselves stumbling in the haze of the mountain, never to ascend.